for the 32nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The first reading is from the first book of Kings. In those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there. He called out to her, Please bring me a small cupful of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, Please bring along a bit of bread. She answered, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar, and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose. But first make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and he and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. Not that he might appear not that he might offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Let us be attentive to the wisdom of Jesus Christ. In the course of his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. They devour the houses of widows and, as a pretext, recite lengthy prayers. They will receive a very severe condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury where people gave money to the temple and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, But she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. The Gospel of the Lord. I apologize again, as I did at the 530 Mass. As most of you, probably a lot of people know, the last couple of weeks I had a very heavy cold and then a touch of pneumonia, and it's all gone away now. But uh, it's left my voice uh, very raspy and uh, unpleasant to listen to, I'm sure. Uh, Unpleasant to use, too. So I apologize for drinking water every once in a while. I want to go back over quickly the two stories, both the last one very familiar to you, maybe the first one also very familiar, and suggest a, a different way of of situating them differently, to listen to them in a different way. They're not, I think, stories that you could just, like quick little stories with a little moral, and you could tag a moral on the end of it, be generous, be good, don't, you know, be, even if you're poor, give things. Those things are true, and they are elements of the story, but I don't think that they are really the depth of what the scripture is talking about, and they're certainly not, it seems to me, They're not talking about what the liturgy wants us to hear uh, this Sunday. So just let me just remind you of them. The first story, as I said, pretty familiar, if you know the Old Testament at all. It's one of the famous miracle stories about the prophet Elijah. There has been a very long drought, and Elijah had left 
Israel, left the Holy Land and gone to a pagan area east of it. And there he meets this woman who is herself not a Jew. And that's very important in the story. She's not one of the holy people. Although clearly, and we'll mention this again, God is very intimately present in her life. That's a kind of subtext of this, that God is present not just in the obvious places, in the Jews, in the church, and things, but he's present everywhere. This mysterious, growing presence of God is everywhere. But anyway, so she is not a Jew. So the prophet asks her for a drink of water, and her first response is a kind of traditional uh, hospitality. She starts to go get it. And then he asks her for food. And she tells him she doesn't have any food, or she has so little food that she's just about to use the last of it, and she and, and there's no more, and she and her son will die. And he says, give me some before you feed yourself. And she does. <clears throat> it's not an act of generosity. It's an act in the story. I mean, the point is, it's an act of trust. She trusts him. And she's able to trust him because in some mysterious God way, in her life, in the course of her life, the God who speaks through him, she recognizes, she knows herself in some way, and trusts him. For the writer of, the biblical writer, the point of the story is the woman is not the point of the story at all. I mean, she's an important character in the story. The story for the Bible is about how God takes care of Elijah. And will do all of these remarkable things to accomplish through Elijah what he wants to accomplish. So the other story, maybe I should just do the two stories first and then go back to think about them the way I want to suggest we should. The other story, much more familiar, but I think would be a mistake to see, first of all, the woman is not going to die. This is not, you don't confuse these two stories. She's just giving away this tiny amount of money that she now has. There's nothing that says she couldn't earn another two small coins the next day. Or keep. This is not an act of desperation or despair. It's just an act of, well, it's an act of generosity. But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say, Call, come over here and all look at how generous she is. Of course, any of you could see how generous she is. She's giving away everything. What he says, if you remember, was she gave, she gave more. Objectively, she gave more. <coughs> and that's what I want us to go back. Why did he say that? That's where I started off trying to think about this. The best way, I think, to think about it is to remember, as in everything in human life, a climactic event like the meeting with the prophet by this pagan woman, or maybe not a climactic, she may have done this many times, this woman, but in any case, a very significant act, doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the whole life. We're invited to realize that over the long story of the life of this woman in that we don't know was Arafat, that we don't know anything about particularly, there had been growing up in her this presence of God, maybe aware, maybe not very aware. She had become the woman who could do that. She had developed habits, certainly virtues of hospitality, but beyond that, virtues of discernment or trust. She became, at this moment, when she had this significant role to play, she was herself. She was what she was meant to be. But it was this long process of development. And I think the same thing with the, with the woman who was giving away what little she had. She wasn't giving it to the poor. This is not generosity. This is not sharing your goods. She was giving it to the temple, which was already vast. She was giving it to God, in a way, to worship. And something had gone on in her life where the ability to face the fears of not having enough money. I know if you ever see people who are, just yesterday I passed a guy, you know, who was wheeling one of the carts, you know, with everything he had on it. And you can't help thinking about the incredible vulnerability of that. No shelter, no, you know, and if you had anything to provide yourself with the next meal, she had reached a point where if you want to put it very dramatic, the praise of God, the gift, who she was, was already the person who was most expressed by this, this act. But what Jesus says is not she's become something. He said she did something. She did more than the others. 
Why? Because she is part of a larger story than just the story of her life. She's part of the story of the holy of the, of the chosen people, God's beloved, who are capable more than anybody else in the world at that time to know Him and to worship Him and to take part in Him. And she gave her whole self to that, unlike the scribes and stuff, who or the rich people who were giving something, but they weren't giving every, they weren't completely part of the story yet. So that's the two things I want to bring together here. Both Elijah and the woman who didn't even know the story. The reason it's an important moment is that it's a moment in which their lives, now having reached the integrity of their lives, being what they were created to be, they played their part in the great story, the story of holy people and the story of the worship of God. It's not that they weren't playing the part before, but that what we're given a glimpse of is the moment that allows us to see the whole thing. And that's exactly about what is, and that's exactly about you and me. For us, the whole story is in the second reading, that remarkable second reading in the book of uh, Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. The whole story for us is Jesus, the divine son, who became man, lived a human life, died and gathered into his death everything in human life that was wounded and sinful and failed. Everything in the cosmos that was not yet what it could be. And gave it, brought it all to the Father. So that it is now in God. Whatever, in God. It is now intensely present to God. It is eternally there. It's going to be spelled out in the lives of the rest of us, but it is there. That's the story. The story of creation reaching its fulfillment by entering the mystery of Christ and being drawn to the mystery of Christ. That's what this is about for you and for me. Most of you, I presume, like me, pretty ordinary people, right? The ones I know, pretty ordinary. This book says a lot of you who are just like the ones I know, pretty ordinary. Right? But, so is the woman, in fact. Both women, very ordinary. So is Jesus, actually, as a human being, what he lived an ordinary life and transformed the world. So, what this suggests to us is that our, what we have to think about tonight is the things that need to go on in our life so that when the moment comes, several times, one time, dramatic, not so dramatic, when I must be myself, I must be what I was created to be, I will be that. And I will fulfill the gift, and I will enter the story, I will live my part in the story of Christ. So you have to develop virtues, first of all. And I would suggest you start with the virtues that you already have. I mean straight old-fashioned virtues. Are you truthful? Are you honest? Are you chaste? Are you diligent? Are you kind? Do you have any of these gifts at all? I don't know, some. Make them grow. They don't grow automatically. Those are your gifts. You, eventually you need them all because it's not just that you do this or do that. You become this. You become this human being who is the expression of God's image. You are a particular expression of God's image. So you have to develop the virtue. But you also have to allow, especially since you're called to be part of this church, more and more this awareness of Christ's intimacy with you. Bring in parts of your life. Just be still with Christ. Say, what's going on here? What is this about? Using the scriptures to hear Christ. Say, Christ, because you're sitting there, for whatever reason you're there, Christ says to you exactly the same thing he said to the rich young man. Come with me. Be with me. Be my comrade. Let me live in you. That's got to grow. That's what you were created for. That's what these stories remind us of. We're part of the great story. You have to get this sense of the great story that your life is part of. Not the great story you've been told so far by TV or whatever, or in the Enlightenment or Cornell. All those are stories. They're real stories, but they're not the great story. They have to be fitted into that. The great story of that which our life is a part is the story of Christ, the divine Son who loved us so much that he became one of us, lived our life and absorbed everything that is in us and brought it back to the Father. So you think about the virtues you develop, 
you allow yourself to become aware that you are Christ's beloved and what that means for you. And finally, you think about your gifts, your brains, your energy, your strength, your beauty, your money, your time. What role do they play? How do you learn to live them so that they will be part of the great story? You see these moments. A woman with not very much, who Jesus says gives more than all the rest. Why? I think because she was really part of what was going on there, completely. It was why she was created. Elijah and the woman didn't even know the name of God, you know, who played a role. You, me too. There will come times in our life, sometimes dramatic, sometimes not, when it will be a moment for me to be, to have become who I was created to be, for you to have become part of the story of Christ. And the, the things we've mentioned point to some of the ways that that necessarily developed. So as not to come to a moment and fail to be what I was created to be, should that terrible thing happen.